Ben Emis Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here. GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you're interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 to 250. Right now we are in the middle of redoing the problems and we are on page number 282. Please turn to it, page number 282 and problem number 81 is the one that we are about to solve. Problem number 81. Let's see what it has to say. We are told that the ratio of students to teachers is same for school M and school P. In other words, the equation that we are given here is that the ratio in the two schools of students to teacher is the same. So here's a here's the number of students in school M, here's the number of teachers in school M, and this ratio is same as the number of students in school P uh, was at, uh, over a number of teachers, number of teachers in school P. So this this part is given to us. What they are asking here is, what is the ratio? Question is, what is the ratio of students? What's the ratio of students in the two schools. That's what they're asking. What's the ratio of students in the two schools? In other words, what they're looking for is this. Number of, number of students in school M to number of students in school P. And they're asking us, what is it? Another way to look at the same question here, before we go any further, let's first understand what is being asked here. Because of the fact that we have this equation here, as student, number of students in school M divided by number of students in school P, if you were to manipulate this thing, you will see that this ratio that they are asking for is the same as the number of teachers in school M to number of teachers in school P. This is what they are asking here. We have to answer, we have to answer, if we answer one, we can answer the other, it's the same thing. So essentially they are asking us, what's the, what's the ratio of students in the two schools, or what's the, which is same as saying what's the ratio of teachers in the two schools. Let's see what they tell us. Statement 1. Statement 1 tells us Statement 1 tells us that the number of students in school M is 10,000 more than the number of students in school P. So whatever the number of students in school P, if you, if you were to add 10,000 to it, that's how many students we have in school M. As we can clearly see, that's not enough. Simply knowing that one school has 10,000 more students than the other does, does not enable us to figure out the ratio of the students in the two schools. Obviously, the first statement is not enough. The first statement is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. And if you still do not know what I do here in the beginning here, it is imperative, it is crucial, it is vital that you watch this video. Just type in data sufficiency intro along with my name, Kishwani, and watch that video. Make sure you know, you understand how to set up these data sufficiency questions. This is the import, This is the most important part. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we have established the first student by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. It will have to be either B, C, or E. Let's look at second statement. In the second statement, they tell us. In the second statement, they're telling us that the number of teachers to number of students. This ratio, the ratio of students to teacher in school M is 1 to 20. It's 1 to 20. Again, we can clearly see that knowing that the uh, knowing the ratio of students to teacher in one school is not enough for us to be able to figure out the ratio of students in the two schools. The second statement by itself is also not enough. The answer cannot be B. Let's put them together. We're going to put the two statements together and we'll see what happens. We'll do it on the top. I mean, we need the room, obviously. So let's, let's do it on the top here. 
So if we put them together, if we put them together, what we find is that this is the first, this is the first equation that we, that we have. Second equation that, and second equation that we have is this equation right here from the first statement. From the first statement, we know that number of students in school M. We know the number of students in school M is 10,000 more than the number of students in school P. That's from the first statement. The second statement tells us that the ratio of teachers to students is 1 to 20. In other words, in other words, in other words, the number of students in school M, number of students in school M, this tells us, this tells us the number of students in school M is 20 times the number of teachers in school M. So now we can erase all of this thing so we can have some room. And remember, all we are interested in is finding the ratio of students in the two schools or ratio of teachers in the two schools. That's all we need. we need. We need this part right here. Number of students to number of... This is what we're looking for, which is same as number of teachers, which is same as number of teachers in school M to number of teachers in school P. This is what we need. Are you able to see, are you able to see immediately where the problem lies? Can you tell me very quickly, and that's the, that's the essence of this problem. The essence of this problem is that you have to be able to analyze them very quickly. Nobody's actually asking you to solve the whole thing. We simply have to establish very quickly with sufficient speed whether or not we have sufficient data, data sufficiency. Do you see a problem here? The problem here is that we have four unknowns. We have four unknowns. Number of students in school M, number of students in school P, uh, number of teachers in school M, and number of teachers in school P. Teachers and students in the two schools, we have four unknowns. And how many equations do we have? We have, oh, I erased, I erased the part that, that, that was given to us. I erased that part. We, we cannot leave that out. We need the third equation. What was given to us in the beginning is that these two ratios are equal number of students to number of teachers is equal. So this is our third equation. This is equation number three. This is what's given to us. We have three equations and four unknowns. We have three equations and four unknowns. It cannot be done. This problem cannot be solved. We cannot solve for any variable at all if we have three unknowns, if we have three equations and four unknowns. It simply is not possible. The answer is E. The answer is E. That's it. As far as the problem is concerned, as far as the exam is concerned, we are done. This is how simple it is. What we're going to do from this point on, listen very carefully, please. This is not something we'll do in the real exam. What we are about to do now is to analyze it a little bit more and understand what could we have what could we have had in order for us to be able to answer the question that is being asked. Let's take a look at it. What piece, what bit of information could we have had and how could we have utilized it? For example, for example, if where can we do it? Let's continue here. If if we if we know the number of teachers in school M, we have to know one variable. If we had known this part, watch what happens. If we had known that part, we can figure out the number of students in school M because number of students in school M, we are told here, is 20 times the number of teachers in school M. So if we know the, if we know the number of teachers in school M, 20 times number of teachers in school M, if we know this quantity, we can figure out this number of students in school M. Once we have the number of students in school M, we could very easily figure out the number of students in school P because it's just 10,000 more. It's simply 10,000 more. That's it. One more time, okay? Or rather 10,000 less, okay? One more time. If we know the number of teachers in school M, if we knew, which we don't, if we knew the number of teachers in school M, we could simply multiply it by 20 and figure out the number of students in school M. Once we have the number of students in school M, we can figure out the number of students in school P, which is simply the number of students in school M minus the 10,000. Minus the 10,000. And once we have the number of students in school P, and once we have the number of students in school M, we can figure out the ratio. But we do not have this thing. This thing is missing. We have to know value of at least one of these four variables 
for us to be able to solve for the value of the other three variables using the three equations that are given to us. We cannot solve for four variables with only three equations. Similarly, similarly, here's another scenario. Another scenario. If, if we know, if we know the number of teachers in school P, if we know the number of teachers in school P, then we know, we know that uh, the ratio is 20 to 1. Where is it? We know that these two ratios are equal. The no, if, if number of teachers, number of teacher, number of students to number of teachers in school P is same as the number of students to number of teachers in school M. So if we know this part, if we know this part, this this ratio, this ratio equals this ratio, and this ratio we know is 20 to 1. Is 20 to 1. So if we know the number of teachers, if we know the number of teachers, this ratio is 20 to 1. If we know this part, we can figure out the number of students in school P. Once we know this number of students in school P, we can figure out the number of students in school M because it's just 10,000 more right here. Once we know the number of students in school P, the rest is very simple. 10,000 more and it gives us the number of students in school M. And of course, once we know the number of students in school M, we can figure out the ratio. Again, we do not know the number of teachers in school P. This problem cannot be solved. The answer is E. But all of this analysis that we just there, that was agonizing, it was painful, and it was a waste of time. It is very simple question, very, very simple question. Four equations, uh, three, uh, three equations, four unknowns, it cannot be done. That's how simple it is. Let's do the next one, shall we? Just give me one quick break, uh, one uh, quick second for... Next problem, number 82. Let's see what they are asking in number 82. Number 82, we are told that R is positive. We are also told that S is positive. The question is, is the ratio of R to S less than the ratio of S to R? Very simple, very straightforward question. Let's see what we can do. In the first statement, they tell us that R over 3S equals 1 4. Okay, listen to what happens. They tell us that R over 3s equals 1 4. Actually, this is a very straightforward problem. And therefore, if you were to multiply both sides by 3, if you were to multiply both sides by 3, R over S, R over S, oh Jesus, R over S equals 3 over 4, right here. The ratio is 3 to qu three, 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 3 quarter. If R over S is 3 quarter, if R over S is 3 quarters, then if R over S, R over S is 3 quarter, then S over R would have to be 4 third. And therefore, the question is, is this is 3 quarter less than 4 third? The answer is yes. Again, the point here is point here is not that the answer turns out to be yes. The point here is that we are able to tell definitively whether or not this ratio is less than the other one. That's all. The first statement does the job very nicely because it's a very simple problem. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that, we, now that we have established the first statement by itself is enough, we know now that the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It will have to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that S equals R plus 4. What the hell? This is also very simple. If S equals R plus 4, that in itself implies that S is more than R. If S is more than R, then R over S is going to be less than S over R. Because S, S we just established is the, the numerator here, S is more than R. If S is more than R, this fraction S over R is going to be more than 1. And this is going to be less than 1. That's all. So the second statement by itself also does the job very nicely. The answer is D. Answer is D. Some of them are gifts, some of them are gifts, and some of them are pure hell. You understand? Let's look at the next one, shall we? Number 83. Again, time for my break. Eighty-three. We are told that k is an integer between fifty-six and sixty-six. We are told that we are told that k is a whole number, is an integer that lies somewhere between fifty-six and sixty-six. The question is, what is it? 
What is cake? Very straightforward, very simple question. Let's see what they tell us. Let's see what they tell us. The first uh, statement tells us that k divided by 2 yields a remainder of 1. k divided by 2 yields a remainder of 1. Well, the very first thing we should understand out of this thing is that when, you, when we try to divide this quantity, if you have some number, and if you try to divide by 2, or if you divide, try to divide by 2 and it turns out that it has a remainder of 1, that in itself implies that k has to be, has to be odd. It cannot be even. Had k been an even number, we would not have a remainder of 1. So k has to be, k has to be odd and it lies between 56 and 66. Let's list them all, shall we? Let's list them. Which this, this, in, this in turn tells us that k could be, could be 57. 59, 61, 63, or 65. There are several possibilities. We do not know what k is. It could be any one of these values. It can be 59, 50, 50, 57, 59, 61, 63, or all the way up to 65. It could be any odd numbers between 56 and 66. The first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. A, D. B, C, E. Now that we've established the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B, C or E. Let's look at the second statement, shall we? I'm going to erase, I'm going to have to erase this part. But before we erase this part, let's put down what the possible values of K were from the first statement. 57, 59, 61, 63 and 65. These are the possible values there, okay? Let's look at the second statement. Second statement tells us, second statement tells us that k plus 1, k plus 1 divided by 3 yields a remainder of 0. Whoa, what do you know? They are telling us that the k plus 1 is divisible by 0, uh, is evenly divisible by 3. So here is our k. Our k is all the way from 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, and 65. Up to so all the way between 56 and 66. Uh, 56 and 66. Therefore, k plus 1, k plus 1, okay, keep listening. Therefore, k plus 1. It's very important that you actually take the time to do that. It only takes a few seconds. Because if you try to be lazy and if you try to cut corners, there is a very good chance that you're going to mess, uh, you're going to mess it up. You understand? You're going to muck it up. You're going to end up getting, uh, making some careless mistakes. So this is 58. This is 59 because it's k plus 1. Whatever the k is, is one more than that. Everything gets shifted by one unit. 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, and 66. We can immediately see what the problem is. What we are told here is that when we divide this quantity k plus 1 by 3, the remainder is 0. Now, is there only one such number in this list? The answer is no. You see, uh, for example, but let's start with a simple one. 63 is one of them. 66 is one of them. And 63 is one of them. And so is uh, 60 right here. There you go. There are three possibilities. One, two, three. There are three possible values that K can be. Second statement by itself also does not yield us a definitive answer. Second statement by itself is not enough. The answer cannot be B. Let's put them together. Let's put them together. So here is our statement. This comes from statement 2 and here, here was our statement 1. Statement 1 tells us that the possible number are these. The statement 1 tells us that the possible numbers are 57, 59, 61, 63, 65 and that's it. 7, 9, 1, 63. There you go. When we put the two statements together, this is statement 1, this is statement 2. Putting them to get together now. This is the together part. When we put them together, well, do we see anything here? Uh, this, this is, I'm going to erase everything else that we're not interested in. Statement, statement, one, statement 2 tells us that the possible value for k are, these are the possible values, these are the possible values for k from statement 2. This is a statement 2. Statement tell, 2 tells us that k can be 60, 63, or 66. This is statement 2. The statement 1 tells us that it can be 57, 59, 61, 63, or 65. 
well, I see 63 here and I see 63 here. If this is the only possibility, if that's the only common number, then we are done. Is that the case? Is that the only common number? Oh, I, I think I just blew it. I think I just blew it. That's it. I got this question wrong. I just blew it. This is a very common mistake. I'm glad that I made this mistake because now we can see how easy it is to make this mistake. Based on the work that I presented to you here, the based on the work that I presented to you here, it seems like we do have a definitive answer. The number would have to be 63 because that's the only one that appears in the two list. And we'll end up picking answer choice C. We'll end up picking answer choice C. C, in fact, is the wrong answer. C, C, in fact, is the wrong answer here. Let me tell you what went wrong. Can you tell me what went wrong? Can you, can, do, were you quick enough to realize what, what mistake I made? I could very easily, you see what happens is that the, the nature of the beast is such that I'm not standing in front of the school, in, in front of the classroom, in front of, of the live audience. This is being taped. I could very easily delete this video, do, the, do this over again, tape the other one and, and post, the, or post the new video and you would never have known that I made that mistake. That's very easily. It can be done very easily. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to actually post this particular video because you're watching it obviously to see how it easy it is to make a mistake and what kind of things can go wrong when one is not paying attention. I cannot believe that I was so sloppy. These values that we see here, 60, 63, 66, they came from not K, but they came from the list of K plus 1. These represent K plus 1. This is K plus 1. In other words, the actual value of K is 59, 62, and 65. Those are the actual values of K. We have to compare these values. So I, I should, let me put it in a different color. I'm not going to erase this thing. I'm going to put them in a different color. We have to compare these values, 59, 62, and 65, versus this list here. And the problem that we see that is, we see 59 here. Here's a 59, and here's a 59. Anything else do we see? Another uh, uh, one see is right here, 65 and a 65. Two numbers appear, two numbers, 59 and 65, appear in both lists. Appear in both lists because both 59 and 65 appear in both lists. The answer, the correct answer is E. The correct answer is E. It is not C. The, the answer of C that we just picked a little while ago is because of the sloppiness. This value, one more time, 60, 63, 66, that came from K plus 1, not K. The question is, what's the value of K? The question was, what's the value of K? The, the statement 1 tells us, the statement 1 tells us that K can be a 57, 59, 61, 63, 65. If we do a proper work, if we had done the proper work, then statement 2 tells us that the K can be 59, 62, or 65. And the reason why the answer turns out to be E is because there are two values that are overlapping. There are two common values in the two sets. Had there been only one common value in the two sets, then the answer would have been C. The answer is E because it can be either 59 or 65. We have no way of knowing for sure what K is. The question is, what's the value of K? The answer is K can be 59 or 65, and therefore the answer is C. Enough of the talk. Enough, enough of that. Let's move on. Number, number 83. I still cannot believe I made such a boo-boo. But what can you do here? Give me a break. Just give me one second. Number 84. Intense concentration is what is required in this exam. Do you understand? If you have a concentration and during the exam, which is 99.99%, that is not good enough. You must give 100% of everything you've got. Everything that you've got, 100% of the concentration, is what is required here. 84. Because as you can clearly, as you can clearly see, the math is not complicated. It wasn't the reason I got it wrong. The reason why I blew it is not because I could not understand the mathematical concepts behind it. The math is very simple. It's just the level of concentration wasn't there. Do you understand? 84. What is the value? What is the value of n in the list? 
in the list, and the list that is given to us is K and 12, 6 and 17. So let's find out. The first statement tells us that K is less than N. Simply knowing that the K is less than N, does that enable us to answer the question that is being asked, which is, what's the value of N? Of course not. Simply knowing that one is less than the other does not enable us to tell, uh, to tell what, what value, value of N is. First statement by itself is not enough. A, B, B, C, E. Now that we have established the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B, C or E. Statement 2. The statement 2 tells us that the median is 10. Median is 10. Well, if median is 10, in order for us to fi find out the median, we have to list the numbers in order. As we clearly see in the list that is given to us, in the list that is given to us, there appears, there appears no 10. There is no 10 in this list, which tells us that one of these two numbers would have to be 10. One of these two numbers have to be 10. So there are two possibilities. One possibility is that we can have 6, then we can have k, and then we can have 10, which, in which case n would be 10, and then we'll have 12, and then we'll have 17. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that we can have the 6, we can have the n, we can have the k, in which case k would have to be 10, then we have 12, and then we have 17. In both of these, in both of these scenarios, this is your median. Right here is the median. Simply knowing that the median is 10 does not tell us which one of these is 10. All we know is that one of these two numbers, based, based only on the second statement, knowing that the median is 10, knowing that the median is 10 and there appears no 10 in the list here, that tells us that one of these two numbers has to be 10. But it doesn't tell us which one. There is no way for us to know which, which one is 10. Is it K or is it N? Second statement by itself is also not enough. Second statement by itself is also not enough. But when we put the two statements together, it's quite straightforward. It's very straightforward because the first statement clearly tells us that K happens to be less than N. If K happens to be less than N, then K cannot be here and N cannot be here. K is less than N. K would have to appear before N in the list. When we arrange them in numerical order, K has to appear before, before N and, there, and therefore N is 10. N is 10. And that was the question. What's the value of N? N is 10. Answer is C. Answer is C. That's all. Let's take a look at number 85. Number 85. Should be good number 85 or should we stop right here? That's what I'm debating here. Let's stop right here. I'm going to do 85 in the next problem, in, in, in the next video. Okay? I'll see you tomorrow. Okay? Bye now.